said, my father can climb the highest mountain. My father could swim the largest ocean. My father could fly the fastest plane. My father could wrestle the strongest tiger. My father can do anything. But most times he just carries out the trash. <laughs> and I do not think it's a matter of intent, but somehow we have fallen into the pattern of encouraging moms on Mother's Day, but on Father's Day we challenge our dads. We honor the position of mother, but we examine the quality of fathering. So in the spirit of what I want to begin in by, by honoring our fathers here today, after all, the Bible says, honor your father and your mother. Both are included, right? Amen. Amen. So dads, we salute you today. We acknowledge all that you do for your families. Amen. We recognize your hard work often goes unappreciated. And that we need to stop and sometimes and say, thank you. So, in that spirit, I want to thank you for loving your wives and your children. I want to thank you for setting an example in your home every day. I want to thank you for the knowledge and the wisdom that you are passing on to your generation. I want to thank you for providing money and income for your families. Hallelujah. I want to thank you for all the hard work you do around the house to keep it in good shape. I want to thank you for the spiritual leadership you provide in the home. Thank you for being there for your family. These are all important aspects of fatherhood. And even though none of us do them perfectly, we are thankful and we honor you today. Amen. We honor you, fathers. We honor you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, seven, having said all of that, I'm still going to challenge you, right? The text for our message today is a well-known one, coming out of the book of Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, the prodigal, the parable of the prodigal son. Now, I must tell you, when I started preparing this message, it was my intention that I was going to concentrate on the father in this story. But the more I meditated and studied the scripture, I just couldn't help get past the context and the reason Jesus told these stories. See, verse 1 and 2 of the chapter tells us what motivated Jesus to give these parables. The enemies of Jesus were criticizing him because of the people he was associated with, publicans and sinners. And the Pharisees and the leaders there could not understand. They were stunned. They were, they, they were surprised that he was associating with such people. And Jesus tells them these parables in response to their, their comments. Now, most times we use this text to address backsliders. And maybe you are not there yet, but maybe you're just not as close as you used to be. Fathers, I want you to listen up carefully. These stories deal with lost things. And every one of the stories in this chapter teaches us a great truth, that every soul is precious to God, even yours and even your children. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. They tell us about lost things, and as Jesus is moving through these stories, he seems to be placing much, much more and more emphasis on the things that are lost, the value of the things. In the first couple of verses in the parable of the lost sheep, there was one sheep out of a hundred, that's one percent. In the next parable about the lost coin, there is one coin out of ten. That is ten percent. In the third parable about the lost son, there is one son out of two sons. That's fifty percent. He seems to be getting, coming. He, in these parables, he is progressing in his importance of the thing that is lost. In the first, in the first two parables, the things are a material and, and, and money. In the last parable that we're going to talk about, it is about humans. Humans that are lost. Humans that are far away from God. Jesus is trying to tell us that every soul is precious. And many of us here today are fathers with children of our own. Maybe some of them have become prodigals. Maybe some of us ourselves have become prodigals. And I believe the Lord wants to speak to all of us today. So lend me your heart for a little bit. As I preach on the subject, come back home to Father's house. Come back home to Father's house. As we consider these verses, 
there are four scenes that are presented to us. The first scene unfolds in verses 11 and 12, where we see the son making an astonishing request. Let us read. Chapter 15 of Luke, beginning at verse 11. And he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. The first thing we see there, there's a shocking request. When this younger son asked his father to divide their estate and give him his share, he was actually saying to his father, I no longer want to be under your control. He was saying to the father, I no longer want you to have any say in my life. He was saying to his father, I want to be free of you. And few of us will say this to our parents, but in reality, this is how the sinner and the backslider lives. They take no concern for God. They choose to live as God does not even exist. It was also a selfish request. Notice his demand of the father. Give me. His focus is me. His life is, li his life is wrapped up in himself and he wants what he wants. He cares for no one else. He was selfish and self-centered, rude and unkind. Notice, he says, give me. He doesn't say, may I have or please. His request and the resultant effect upon his father and the estate is of no concern to him. The father could be hurt. Maybe the, the, the economy of the estate would be hurt, but he couldn't care less. He wants what he wants. And he had not earned it, so he didn't really deserve it. The father could have kicked him out and refused to give it to him, but notice the father. In spite of his insensitive request, the father is so gracious, the word tells us, and he divided unto them his living. See, this father had poured his life into building this estate so that he would have something to pass down to his sons. And this younger son wanted what the father could give him, but he did not want the father. And this is the attitude of the lost sinner and the backslider. They take no thought for God. Their attitude to what God is, give me. They want God's air, God's water, God's food, God's provision, God's life, but they do not want God. And every day that we men live on this earth, we consume the resources God has provided for us. And so many people do not want God. They want what God can give them, but they do not want Him. And you know what? If that is you and that is how you want to live your life, then God will allow you to do it. Amen? If you want to take all you can get from him and not acknowledge him, he will let you do that too. But you need to understand, there is coming a day when you will have to answer. For Proverbs 16, 25 reminds, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And in scene 2, we see an awful reality. And not many days after, the young son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And there he wasted his substance with riotous living. This son gets what he wants, but soon finds out that being away from his father's house is not all that is cut out for. Because I want you to see in these verses the reality of sin's pleasures. He takes his father's gracious provision and he squanders it by giving a wicked self-indulgent lifestyle. The phrase riotous living speaks of a life that is totally given over to sinfulness and wickedness. You see, away from the father's house and away from the father's presence, this young man cast off all moral restraints and gave himself over to gratifying every woman, every desire of the flesh. Did he have a good time? Oh yes, I believe he did. Sin has its pleasures, don't get me wrong. But it's only for a season. Just as the trees outside has green leaves, there was one day they will dry and fall off. The seasons of life change a church. And when they do, everything that brought pleasure at one time in your life is going to bring you pain instead. A life that has lived in alcohol and drugs, a life that is indulging in sexual sins, a life that is for fleshly pleasures, a life lived for self. All of these end up in the same place. Yes, pleasure may be found in these things, but only for a short time. 
want you to understand an eternity in hell is not worth the short times you will be in the pleasures. Amen? I want you to see also the realities of the price that sin brings with it. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Eventually, his money ran out. And along with the money, his friends ran out. The far country, the land of wine, woman, and song, now became a land of weeping, worry, and sorrow. He found out all too late that sin comes with a high price. This young man squandered away all the blessings of his father and he was left with nothing. And this is the state of many believers today. When they left the father's house, they were full. But now they have seen that sin and loose living take away the blessings from them and they are left empty and alone. They no longer can enjoy the things of the father. But I want you to know that this is how sin treats all of its victims. It will promise you the world, but it can only deliver hopelessness, desolation, and death. It comes with dividends that you cannot imagine. Broken lives, ruined marriages, shattered dreams, damaged trust, health problems, defeat, depression, death. They are all part of the package that sin brings along with it. Someone has rightly said it. Sin is going to take you farther than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you plan to stay. And it will cost you more than you can afford to pay. Amen. Sin will take your play, your peace. It will take your assurance. It will take your joy. It will take your devotional life. It will take your prayer life. It will take your witness, your testimony. It will take everything of value to you and it will leave you spiritually destitute and broken. Many of you know what I'm talking about. These were all part of your life and at one time, but being away from the Father's house, you have lost them. They are no longer part of your life. You see the devil when he comes to you, to in entice you with sin. He doesn't tell you, you know, you're going to enjoy this for a time and it's going to be nice. But he doesn't tell you in the end, you are going to end up broken. It is what, this, if that is where, and I, I want to speak to you, fathers, if it's, that is where you are, it is time to come back to the father's house. Hallelujah. See also the reality of sin's pain. And he went and joined himself to a certain citizen of that country and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he fain would have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat and no man gave unto him. Because of his foolish decisions, this young man found himself in a mess. That condition that, and in that condition, he learned some valuable lessons. He learned that sin brings a shame and suffering and sorrow. Here is a Jewish man who finds himself feeding pigs. For the Jew to stoop to this level would mean that he had reached at the bottom of the barrel. I imagine that the people listening to Jesus would be shocked that a Jewish man could come to this place. But you see, when you allow sin to have its way in your life, you always come to shame sooner or later. The shame of a wasted life. The shame of a wasted youth. The shame of wasted opportunities. But most of all, the shame of a wasted eternity. What a disgrace it is to sacrifice your, your finances and your fitness and your, and your fortune to sin. The Lord will not have it that way. What a shame to live that way. Worst again, what a shame to die that way. And so many, sadly, so many live like hell. Believers I'm talking about, they live like hell and they don't seem to be bothered at all about it. But there is coming a day when we will be ashamed in the Savior's side. And no little children abide in him that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Here he is, this prodigal, no home, no help, no hope. No one cares for him. 
He is starving and considering eating the pig's food. He is suffering because of the choices he's made. When he left his father, he became fatherless. When he left his home, he became homeless. When he wasted all of his money, he became penniless. And through his unrestrained, riotous living, he's now wallowing in the pig pen. His life slides deeper and deeper into squalor. In the end, he is friendless and foodless. Fatherless, homeless, penniless, friendless, foodless. That's where sin will take you. God the Father is watching how his rich and rebellious children squander his love and his riches as they run from him into a far country of sin. They want all the goodness of God, but they do not want him. You see, when you choose to live for yourself before long, you will end up living by yourself. And if that is you today, may I say to you, it is time to come back to the Father's house. In scene three, we see the prodigal's return. And when he had come to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise, and I will go to my father and say unto him, Father... I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. This young man made up his mind that he was going back to his father. Just as he had left everything, he had left his father, he made up his mind he was going to leave everything behind and go back to the house of God. Listen, friend. You have to decide for yourself just what being back at the father's house means to you. You must be willing to pay whatever price is necessary to make that happen. It's going to take a resolved heart to get back home. You have to want the Father more than you want the world. Because if you want the world more than you want the Father, you will not make a move to go back to the Father's house. And whatever it is, whatever the cost, maybe a relationship, a job, friends, interests, addictions, whatever it is, you have to come to the point of giving it up so you can get back to the Father's house. What it is that keeping you out in the world? What is it that you have engrossed in so that you cannot come back to the Father's house? Your Father is worth the price and he will receive you, but it will require that we repent of our sins. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all righteousness. When we are willing to admit our wrongdoing and confess our sins to the Father, he is more than willing to receive us. Hallelujah. Because we can never come home until we first repent of our sins. In scene four, we see an awesome reunion. As this man is headed home, he is not sure what he is going to find. The word says, and he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto the father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Notice something. He had prepared a speech that he was going to bring to the father. But the father stopped him in the middle. Hallelujah. But the father said unto the I am... I, let me see, and the son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. He didn't get to finish the rest. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fathered calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. See, he wasn't sure what he was coming home to meet, but what he found was something incredible. He found something waiting for him that he had never experienced in the far country. He found the love of the Father that was manifested in several ways. He found a Father that was waiting and watching. You see, you don't notice things far off in the distance unless you are looking for them, right? It was no coincidence that this father saw the son from afar off. It tells me that this father was always looking. Every day he was scanning the horizon to see his son, whether they were coming. He was expecting that his son would return. 
So he found a father watching and waiting. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. He wasn't informed by the servants that your son has come. No, he saw it for himself. And I'm saying this to you because I want to tell you, your father has not forgotten you. You may be wandering far away from him, but the minute you take the step to come home, your father is looking for you. And he is going to see you. Because God has not stopped looking for you, father. He found a father moved with compassion. This father felt the pain of his son. No doubt the son looked terrible. Probably dressed in rags and the filth of the pig pen covering him. But the father didn't care. His son was at home and that was all that mattered. That was the main thing. And you may have gone into the world, but the father still loves you. And his desire more than anything is to have you home in his heart. His heart was moved. He found a father who ran to meet him. You see, it was not dignified for an older man to run. He would have to lift up his, his clothes to run. But this father threw all of that to the wind and ran to his son. And he hugged him and kissed him. But you see, there was another reason why I believe that father ran to meet his son. You see, when that son left home, he didn't, he didn't leave on, on good terms, did he? He had demanded his inheritance prematurely from his father. And according to the law, he would be considered a stubborn and rebellious son. And he could have been stoned. And this is what the father did. Before the neighbors could come out with their stones, the father ran and embraced his son. So that everybody would know, according to him, this is my son. And you see, all too often, when prodigal people, when the prodigals come back home, we, the church, do not embrace them. We are ready to throw stones. But I want you to see what the Father does. This is what our Heavenly Father does for us as repentant sinners. He literally imposes himself between us and his wrath. He extends mercy and grace. And so puts away danger from us. This is what the doctrine of justification is all about. We are given a right standing with God. When we come home, hallelujah, he found a father who kissed him. The word kiss there is in the present tense with me that the father didn't stop kissing with one kiss. He continually kissed his son. In spite of the smell, in spite of the filth, in spite of the hurt, in spite of the pain and the loss, the father continued Kissing his son. This was the ultimate sign of acceptance by the father. The law demanded death, but grace extended through the kiss of the love. Hallelujah. Instead of a funeral, we had a feast. Hallelujah. He found a father who restored him. The robe spoke of purity. Here stands the son in the rags of his sins, he doesn't look like his father, but the father orders that the best of his robes be bought and put on his son. The robe would cover all the stains and the dirt and the sin of his shame. This robe would make him look like his father. If anyone saw him, man wearing this, they would mistaken him for his father. Because the robe erased all the visible signs of his son's imperfection and sinful past. You see, when the sinner comes home, they receive, we receive a heavenly robe from up above. Hallelujah. It is not the robes of good works and human witness. It is the righteousness of Jesus imputed to all of us who receive him by faith. And when we are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus, all the pain and all the stain of our past is washed away forever. Hallelujah. All the dirt... And all of the sin of our life is washed away because we are now clothed in the robe of righteousness. That's what we find when we come back to the Father's house. He found a ring, spoke of his privileges. After the robe came the ring, the ring was a symbol of sonship and authority. The one with the ring can now speak for the Father. The one with the ring has access to all that belongs to the Father. The one with the father's ring was in a position of great privilege. 
when we as sinners repent of our sins and come home, we are given the privilege of being recognized as his sons. Hallelujah. We are given the privilege of speaking for our Father. We are allowed access to all that belongs to our Father as well. And when we come to the Father, he opens up the storehouses of his grace and he gives us everything he has. Hallelujah. What privilege we have as those who have come home to the Father. He puts shoes on his feet. The servants and the slaves wore, were barefoot. Only the sons wore shoes. And this prodigal returned home hoping to be a mere servant. But the father is determined to recognize his position as my son. Hallelujah. In the prodigal's eyes, he didn't deserve anything from the father. But the father looked at him and said, this is my son. He called for the fatted calf. Speaks of rejoicing. The fatted calf was kept for special occasions. The fatted calf was the father's way of sharing his joy with all around. Instead of a wasted life, this father was celebrating a life that was redeemed and now restored. Oh, hallelujah. Everything that was missing in the pig pen, the son is having it again. This is how... It is when the sinner comes home to God. Ah, this is how it is when we come back to our father's house. Hallelujah. And here is where the gospel defies every human expectation. We think the son might be chastised. We think the father would have been generous if he would only allow the son back as a servant. We think the son could and perhaps should have been cut off. We think that he had wasted his inheritance. How could he now come back? To the father's house asking for forgiveness. But the father in this story is a reflection of God our father. Hallelujah. And he pours the storehouses of his grace and his mercy. At the sign of his son's return and repentance. Oh the distant sighting of the sinner's repentance. Oh as soon as the Lord sees you. I want to tell you he's ready to open up his storehouses. The sinner who turns finds that he turns right into the waiting arms of a loving father. And God the Father receives the penitent with the riches of heaven. A robe of Christ. A signet ring of sonship. A banquet of salvation. A kingdom for a beggar. This is what heaven is. A kingdom for a beggar. Hallelujah. And it makes God's riches all the more so much glory. Maybe you are in that same position as the prodigal son today, church. I don't know where you are. May I say to you, Jesus went to the temple. and He said to them, my house shall be called a house of prayer. I don't want you to think that the house of the father is just a mental ascent. It is a place. The temple was the place where the children of God met. The temple was the place where the children of God met to worship. The temple was the place where the children of God met to fellowship. I'm speaking about a place. It is a place. It is a place. It is a house. When I say come back to the Father's house, I do not just mean come back to the Father mentally. I mean come back to his house. Because in his house there is worship. In his house there is fellowship. In his house there was praise. In his house there was prayer. In his house there, was, there were miracles. In his house there are people just like you, with hurting just like you, with deserving of sins just like, deserving of repentance just like you. In the Father's house, I want to tell you, come back to the Father's house. Amen. Hallelujah. Because in the Father's house is where you will find him waiting for you. He's waiting for you. If you have wandered away from him, may this be a day of turning from him. Will you come back to the Father? Hallelujah. Oh, praise the Father. We give you praise today, Lord. We honor you as our heavenly Father. We honor you as the one who holds no grudges against us. We honor you as the one who loves us above all things. We honor you, O oh God, because your eyes are constantly looking at us. 
And when we wander far from you, oh Father, your arms are always open. Your heart is broken when we are away from you because you long for us to be home with you. So God, in the name of Jesus, I speak to the fathers in the house today. Maybe we have strayed from you. We ourselves have become prodigals in some way. But Lord, I ask that you will speak to every heart today, father, mother, children. God, in the name of Jesus, that you will bring back the lost. You will speak to the backslider. Those who are lukewarm and cold, oh Lord, I speak to them right now. In the name of Jesus, we the church call them back into the Father's house. We reach out to them wherever they are in the spirit. We break the hold of Satan upon their lives. Right now, in the name of Jesus, and the church Amen. believed with me and said, Amen. Amen, Amen, the Lord bless you. Thank you for listening.